Yeah, uh, because uh, the, the lute is an instrument that uh, is uh, well known in certain circles, but still has an air of mystery for the majority of people. And it is this beautiful, uh, beautiful painting behind me. You can see the angel playing because in the most common iconography, the lute played by by an angel, it brings you towards the, the greatness of God and the beauty of a paradise. But clearly, this is uh, you know the, one of the first images we have uh, of uh, the instrument. But the lute has a story very, very complex. Here we have uh, a scheme of what actually you needed to do to build an instrument. Bear in mind that uh, this is a version of the lute uh, on the, um, around the Renaissance, the, around the end of the 15th century. But the lute in itself uh, is an instrument with much more uh, age and mystery. We do not know how the lute, uh, as we know, arrived in Europe. We can only suppose it was during the invasion of the Moors in, uh, in Spain at the beginning of the 11th century because uh, the lute is somehow related the transformation of the the old that is still used in North Africa in certain countries on the, the Middle East. The uh, the old take the name of uh, my Arabic is very minimal, but al old means uh, the wood one because uh, to, def to describe that he has a base around the base, as you can see earlier, made in this very thin uh, strips of wood that they created the harmonic the body of the instrument. For the, the Arab world, the Aoud is considered the prince of the instrument. The actual name is Amir Aoud. The, the best. By the way, in the 11th century, 12th century, it started to develop uh, in, uh, in Europe, and we know that uh, in the 13th century, to be able to play the lute in a version that is quite different than this one, I'll show you over there with me, I'll get to the, sorry, the medieval version, sorry, so many images. Right, this one is a slightly similar to what the medieval lute used to be. Because he had a smaller body, six B chords, because the lute, people think, oh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's tuned like a guitar. It is not. The guitar and the lute, they are not related whatsoever. It's a some very severe misconception that for us lutenists is like, it's an irking aspect. <laughs> because the lute is composed, the medieval one, of five B chords, so two strings next to each other, tightly um, you know, fixed with the skis, and uh, a bass one. This is the medieval instrument that uh, it was used, as I say, in the courts, you know, basically the most, uh, I would say, um, genteel people, including the kings and aristocracy, they were very good player of lute. One of the most famous in the 13th century was Prince Manfred of Neustaufen, the son of Frederick the Redhead. Redbeard, sorry, yeah. You know that during his captivity in Bologna composed a lot of music, but unfortunately, no one has a trace because at the time the music was played not on, uh, as we do now, on the script, but just about here. So anyway, this is a beautiful figure, a lady playing the lute, and here, very important, we have the witness of the first uh, um, example of uh, tablatura. Because the lute, obviously, the everything is easy like uh, other instruments. Lutenists started to write down in the 16th century the music in this kind of system using isogram, so six lines. You know, one more of the pentagram they use in modern days, using different systems. We have a different school of tablature or notation. The Italian using numbers on the lines and uh, representing where the finger has to stay on the frets uh, and so on. The French using letter A, B, C, D. The German, more complicated, they use both a mixture between letters and numbers but no lines. So believe me, studying you know, German composer is like quite difficult. Anyway, stepping back uh, on this, uh, talking back again, my, sorry, my, I'm a little bit of as well. Okay, this is one, as I mentioned, but you can see very uh, clearly how the classic lute Renaissance uh, should have been made. 
We have 12, in our tradition, we have 12 uh, pieces of wood giving this uh, rounded shape. And inside, uh, there are basically strips of paper to keep the, the, the wood together. And they attach it to the neck. And the, the, the part of the neck where we uh, have the bottom of the keys, where the, cord, the strings are tied. Now, strings. That for is one of the gain that we have not for why? Because if you are a proper lutenist, you try to use a caput like in the medieval and Renaissance times. And uh, uh, cat would give us very particular sound, very gentle, absolutely unique, uh, that metal, modern, uh, plastic strings, uh, they don't give you. So, uh, I have to consider this, that when you have the keys, uh, etc., and the cat would, they tend to come off, uh, and you need it, basically, even during a piece, uh, you need it to retune it, because it loses, you know, the, the tension. But at the same time, uh, given this instrument, it is a most amazing, beautiful, you know, uniqueness. So, carry on. Uh, here we have another beautiful example. This is probably one of, actually one of the first, uh, because as you can see, a 1480 um, fresco, where you can see a, a crossover between the medieval and the Renaissance lute. What is the difference? As I mentioned earlier, the medieval lute used to be extremely small compared to the, to the Renaissance one. Also here, even if it's not very clear detectable, the strings are more than six, they are eight. Because around that time, uh, another set of string B chords were added. They were basically uh, to allow the, um, male voices, more bass, you know, to have like the possibility to perform and to sing because it was at the time that the lute started to be used by the wandering minstrels. When before it was a little bit more only for the upper classes and etc. So this is the first uh, depiction of a crossover um, lute. As you can see also in the middle on the rows we are still a motives that is very Arabic type, very Moorish even if it was like, uh, as you can see, this fresco is in Rome. But, you know, the evolution of the instrument can be, can be varied and very, sometimes very difficult to trace and, and so on. Now, as you, this is the detail, but as you can see, it's not very clear for me because I think I messed up the image. Sorry. No, it's okay. So this is the one we just saw now. As you can see here, the, the rose is different again, it changed. Because also, we think, it's not very, we're not certain, that each maître luthier had their own way to, to, to create their own symbol, to leave their imprint in the rose. Now, uh, this is a, a video, if I can make it play, of a medieval lute. This chap, is a Frana, is one of the most accomplished Italian lutenists. And is, he has a huge collection, and this lute is clearly still uh, showing a Moorish uh, influence, as you can see. Will you try make it play? Yes, please. I don't know what the people. Right? Make it play. Make it play. Anyway. Because obviously, even in the, the music, not only the shape of the instrument, also the music is a detectably different in the century. The music in uh, medieval time was more uh, still influenced by certain uh, very, how can I say, early type of very uh, heavy beat and etc. But so, uh, doesn't play. Sorry, you can find it in YouTube, Pekka Frana. Now. This is a, uh, is a play and um, a painting that uh, I adore because it's a portrait of Artemisia Gentileschi, very famous uh, Renaissance artist. And uh, she was uh, also an accomplished lutenist. And here you can see a Renaissance lute, as I mentioned earlier, larger than uh, the medieval. And, uh, you know, beautiful portrait, but, uh, you know, depict the woman that she was very accomplished in the arts because uh, uh, to be a lutenist, to be able to perform with such an instrument uh, means that you were extremely um, versed in the arts and in the, the good living, and especially 
for a character like her, the Chandler went to the famous problem with the rape and the process, the, the tribunal, and etc. She wanted to portray on someone a little bit more above the everyday life. So this is a very important point, female point of view because she has this gaze to say, "Hey, I'm an artist. I'm a woman, and I don't care about what else. You know, I'm I'm an artist in full, you know, full hundred percent." So. Again, the different of the, the roles. This is probably later, different artists, obviously from Master Luthier, but uh, again, the infinity of the, the type of the roses, they are like, you can, every little basically, you can recognize uh, from the maturity they come from. Shortly, I think, is going to be the next. Here we are, again, this is another video, but probably we will not be able to, to play. Choose this because here we have uh, an ensemble currently performing in Spain with a, a, a Renaissance lute that is a crossover between the lute as we know and what is the lute in Spain. Because in Spain the lute changes slightly shape and becomes more guitar-like. Not a guitar, but similar shape, still rounded at the back and known as a viuela. The Spanish Renaissance uh, lute uh, or viuela as, um, was used in, uh, in a different type of music. You can have a sort of, uh, you can recognize uh, the, the various schools, the Italian the Renaissance music is very, very relaxed, very gentle, very, very soft. The Spanish is more zesty, more, you know, flamboyant and etc. But, um, Again, yeah, change doesn't work, but uh, UL is still in use uh, quite a lot uh, in ensemble music, more than the single lute. Because other things we have to say, the lute is the kind of instrument that if you play here, at the end of the corridor, you will not be able to listen to, to hear it, because it's very, very soft and they tend to disappear in the space. So, uh, now. Now, this is another beautiful image of a lutenist, you know. Even if uh, this chap depicted by uh, Van Hart, uh, Franz Van Hals, uh, is smiling, etc., but a lutenist, you never smile like that. Because every 33 minutes or 4 minutes, you need to stop and retune you know, your instrument. This um, is a Renaissance, a very late uh, Flemish instrument, that is start to have a very particular um, um, what is called, um, particular detail because the neck is a slightly shorter than the Renaissance European and special Italian one. At the time, the master of uh, Luthier, master of the Lutenists, were in Germany. Um, a group of, uh, I think there were three brothers called Tiefendrücker. That they created the most beautiful, absolutely incredible instrument, some of which they are still kept in some museum. The most famous is in Florence, in the museum, I think it's the Bargello, I'm not 100% sure of the name, sorry, my apologies. But um, it is very important because uh, that Tiffendolka, uh, when it was restored recently, uh, maybe 20 years ago, they realized that the, the paper keeping the, the slatting together. There were pages of one of the earliest, for maybe not the first one, definitely nearby, a uh, Bible by, uh, by Gutenberg. Mm. So you have the most beautiful instrument that is play, still played beautifully with inside pages from the first ever printed uh, book with the mobile character inside. And it's an absolute jewel and to be able to hold it, not to play because only a few, very few people that are allowed to, to, to play and perform, but uh, it's uh, one of the most incredible experiences. Another Tiffenbrück, I'm not 100% sure because it's never been dated, but I just studied of the rose, is the one kept in the Schmollian Museum in Oxford. And it is not far from the famous uh, Stradivari, the Messiah. And it's very sad because, like the Messiah, this uh, violin, Tiffany Brücker or not, not being played, is dying. Because something that this instrument they always have, especially from the Renaissance and after, they needed to be played uh, not like the medieval ones standing, like the minstrel playing like this. The Renaissance, the Baroque needed to sit down and you hug the instrument. 
So the body temperature helps the, the wood to contract and give this beautiful roundness, you know, incredible soft sound. So to be kept in the case, in the glass case, means it's gonna die. You just know that already. Anyway, again, I was mentioned the detail, the, the rose. This is another depiction of a uh, lute, more complicated as a construction. Probably an instrument like this never existed, it's only for a pictorial. But in the 16th century, we start to move from the classic uh, production of lute with the 12 uh, and, you know, change, getting some sort of a more um, expanded, you know, uh, body. But, uh, you know, these are the, I, say, I suppose it never existed because it's too many, too many, and they will never be able to play nicely. But what are very important is for me, because this is related to uh, Vincenzo Galilei. Does it remind us something, the name? Yeah. Vincenzo Galilei. Galileo. Yes, it was his father. Okay. His father was the most accomplished and most uh, delicate uh, composer, his work at the Fronimo, that was published in Venice uh, in the mid uh, uh, century, is uh, one of the most beautiful, beautiful work you can have, you can find. And uh, well, again, let's show. Sorry, I think I delineated the video on this one because it was very, very, not very good to play. Anyway, so um, here we have the depiction of the most common and elegant instrument that the, the gentil classes they would ever have in their, in their uh, houses at the time: the lute, the spinetta, or cl um, clavichord. But not uh, in your case, it's called virginal. Virginal. Thank you very much. And the most important design of the glass hour, because. Uh, the lute, like a majority of other instruments, but mostly the lute, has a, a very intense symbology in uh, those days. And the glass hour means, you know, it's a cinema of the time that go by, they lose it, you know. You, if you need it to be always in constant reminder that life is uh, ready to be kind of snuff. Quite up to in these days with the pandemic, don't you think? <laughs> but anyway, again, another example, not very clear, of uh, tabulatura. There is uh, another hexagram, probably Italian, because uh, you can see the numbers sort of. I forgot to say that uh, the lute in the neck uh, uh, has uh, this. Uh, first of all, most of you play the lute on, you know, sitting down on your lap. The, you play your small finger on the on the board and you keep a play, playing with the, the B chord with uh, your right hand and on the neck with your with your left. Now something that all the you never find a lutenist, especially a female lutenist with nail. Because to be able to play uh, the, the chord, the B chord, you need to play with this part of the finger. So no nail whatsoever. At the moment my nails are too long to play. And uh, so, something that you have to bear in mind, that you will never, ever, ever find the witness with decent hands. So, anyway, I have a beautiful uh, image here of a lute, uh, much later, with uh, the usual instrument that were fas fashionable at the time. First of all, this is a Caravaggio. Again, the face of the player is a little bit more apt for a lutenist because he's not exactly happy, because I probably no. think something go wrong. But anyway, <laughs> no, seriously, because of the cap cut that was used at the time, obviously, cap cut, as you know, is the, the intestine of the sheep. To be able to, to make a string that is the right thickness uh, is extremely laborious and extremely complicated because uh, you can uh, end up with, with one end very thin and the other uh, chunky. So you never be able to find. So you need to work and to pull it, to pull it until you get uh, the, the right thickness for the right uh, um, chord that you want to sound you want to get. And uh, bear in mind you have to play both at the same time, at the same thickness. Eh? Don't forget that they tend to snap. And one of the most common injuries when, especially in these days, you want to use both the cut with even the metal one or the plastic, they snap you have, you get you in the constantly get hit by the the string. But uh, yes, that is a part uh, you can expect. 
Here you can see the instrument that uh, they were very common at the time, uh, the viola, the, the small, the flute, the recorder, uh, we call flaut, uh, and uh, the little version. This is very, very common portable instrument that was very fashionable in the upper class. It's very difficult to, uh, to, to play because of the, the, the keys were really, really small. Something else also very interesting here, in one of the first depictions the Caravaggio makes on the bow. Now we imagine the bow in this shape, but prior to that, the bow was literally bowed. You know, when you play the violin on the viola, it used to be like this. I used to play with this arch and the strings, and the, the horse hair, you know, they used to be very, how can I say, stinky. Because the best horse hair used in the bowl, they were um, basically they had to be soaked for a long time in the horse urine. So, believe me, they're unpleasant. Ah, something also I forgot to mention, and that is my mistake. When I mentioned the medieval, uh, the medieval lute, I forgot to say that the lute uh, they used to be played with a quill, like a, a plectrum plucked, only in the Renaissance, which they realized they could play with the finger. Before, they used to play with the plectrum, with the, with the feather like this, with this part. And that depiction, where you can see the you know, people playing like this. But anyway, sorry, my mistake for a lot. So in the, probably around early, the four, early 1400, they start to use the, the fingers. Not mine, because uh, I can't play anymore, but anyway. This is another depiction of the lovely tablatura. This is again a beautiful example of a lute that probably didn't exist to me like that, but uh, you know, it looks good at the painting. This is uh, basically 1650. Now, in 1650, we have to um, realize that uh, until then, music uh, was kept like a secret. Nothing was written. Only around the early 1600, the book of written notation, like the one we saw start to appear. Before everything was passed by, you know, by the by the teacher to the pupil, and that's it. Nothing else. Only uh, the first one of the first uh, uh, recorded books for notation and instruction how to play is by Francesco da Milano. Francesco Pirola is another one in around uh, 16, 1581. But we don't have a volume. There is only some pages, some leaf left in some library. I think it's in the Marciana in Venice by Capirola, and Francesco da Milano the, is the first one in around 1600 that he started actually to write down, because it was kept, you know, to be a lutenist, to be able to play, was a synonymous of something extremely precious not to be shared with the others, very generous. Also, to be a lutenist, uh, give access to, you know, to courts and so forth. One of the most famous Italian lutenists, even if he acted as a secretary, was uh, uh, David Rizzio, they become the secretary and uh, favorite musician of uh, Mary Queen of Scots. So that he was about directly killed, allegedly, whatever, etc., etc. But yes. Again, stepping back on the symbology, this is one of the most famous paintings with, with the lute that is kept in the National Gallery by Hans Holbein, the ambassadors that probably you know very well. And apart from the the more the, the skull the skull appearing signing the fact the signing the main tomorrow remember you gonna die is the fact that the symbology here is very clear. The lute here is represented with a couple of strings red and this represents discord because the legend goes that these two gentlemen, the two ambassadors, they were yes friends but they were actually having some issues, so hold by, using this, uh, uh, this little trick, uh, try to remember that uh, life is not only transit, but it goes also through phases where, uh, you know, you can have like contrast with people. So this is one of the most beautiful uh, representation of the loop. And as you can see, this is very philologically correct, where so you have like, a, the, if you count it, they come up with 12, uh, 12 uh, uh, pieces of wood to make the body. Now, now, come on, right. 
As I said, the, the Luta had, as I mentioned earlier, had a constant evolution from medieval plot to Renaissance and to joining the two bays, uh, Bicord and etc. We end up uh, with the Baroque uh, expression. In Baroque, everything was great, big, everything was more. This is the Luta, uh, Renaissance Luta, uh, as you can see, and next to it is the song for, called Chitarone Romano. The, the Luta here has uh, eight. Um, Chords. The chitarone here, as you can see, has a double neck because it becomes more and more desirable to have an instrument with more and more strings that to, to give a different range of sounds. So the, the chitarone or theorbo, as it's called in, in circle even today, has a, a double neck and the, the player plays only with the, the strings attached to the the smaller uh, neck, and the other one play by sympathy. The vibration makes play all the others, you know. And it is quite, uh, it's a very beautiful instrument. The best uh, player at the moment is a chap called um, Peter Martins that just moved like London with this collection, which is a huge, fantastic collection of lutes and theorbos. And, uh, you know, valuable, valuable knowledge. And, um, here we have uh, the depiction at the time. These are modern instruments, but these are the depiction of uh, the Theorbos Chitarone Romano on the left, and the smaller version called the Paduano uh, Theorbo, that is a shorter, but it has different complex the, the, the chords that go tied in a different way. Very difficult instrument, very similar to the French Theorbo. They reaches the absolute aberrant, aberrant number of 14 uh, B chords and is uh, one of the most difficult instruments to play. Frankly, not very good sound, but you know, people like it. I think the, the beauty of the Renaissance it gets lost during the Baroque times because uh, too much uh, gets to, you know, even if it's very pleasant still. I'm very fond of it, this version than this. Now, this Teorbo, Roman Teorbo, as I said, and the Paduan. Bear in mind that the neck in some of the, um, the most famous Teorbos reached nearly two meters long. So you imagine to go out on the tube today when uh, the <laughs> instrument is nature, as, as Peter Martin does. This can be quite uh, a task. But anyway, now, the da ah, ha ha. This is an example of notation, mm -hmm. tabulatra. This is, this is what we know now, the pentagram with the, the note notation, as we know with the different scale and etc. Here we have an example of uh, the German one, the most uh, hated and difficult uh, for uh, beginners, or even for a professional now still, because the music for uh, uh, to develop in Germany is a very beautiful, very stern, but absolutely delightful. But believe me, to learn how to play on this, to read this, is like, ooh. Anyway, and above you have all the other ones, different types, different, uh, the French, and I believe this is, uh, uh, this is the Italian, no, the Italian one. No, the Italian is the top one. But uh, as you can see, if you are a proper lutinist, you like to play, not using the hexagram that you can find easy because everybody knows the music, but you want to, the, the finally is to be able to master the various uh, system, the various uh, uh, tablature for each specific piece or also. Okay. Now, we go back to, you say, you know, we've been talking about the evolution during the centuries. I haven't mentioned a composer apart from Galilei and, and Capirola and Milano. Obviously, uh, the various uh, countries where the lute uh, was uh, uh, in use for centuries and centuries, they have their own uh, characteristics, their own schools and so forth, you know. In Germany, we have, as I mentioned earlier, it's very stern, but beautiful, you know. Um, the most important German composer, I would say, that is in the 17th, early 1700s, is Bach, obviously. You know, they composed quite a lot for lute. When he said, uh, you know, I had to make uh, a, a paragraph for specific in the UK. In England, the lute was in use in the court, especially in the Tudor times. Richard III, Panvaginet, was known to be a famous lutenist, but we don't have any images, nor any you know, any, nothing written, it's only in the legend. Henry, 
uh, Tudor, Harry VIII, it was an accomplished lutenist, as he was his daughter. Legend says that Henry composed uh, one of the most famous chansons called uh, Pastime with Good Companies, even if uh, really was a, they said it was not actually him, even if it was a good, good um, player, but apparently it was uh, someone else composing the, the lyric and etc. He will sing uh, um, and perform on the lute uh, Green Sleeves, was his family to dedicate uh, quite a lot to his various wives. But uh, even Elizabeth was an accomplished lutenist because at the time uh, um, the most famous composer, it was this Irish gentleman called John Dolan, that is an absolutely you know, uh, is a gem. The work is suggested to check even on YouTube or get a CD of John Dola, Lacrime, or uh, The Pavano for a Lady, My Lady Sorrow, absolutely beautiful. Because as I mentioned earlier, the lute has been always used to represent the music of the highest, for God, the other, or for love. Because uh, the lute is famous to be uh, used in uh, you know, in, during the century to sing of love, love lost, love sufferings, and etc. John Dolan has become the perfection on this style. At the end, I have, but it doesn't work unfortunately, but I warmly recommend to check for this little track called um, Come Again by John Dolan, one of the most beautiful ever composed. In the last uh, uh, hundred years, uh, the lute uh, resurrected because after the, the 1750, music uh, um, started to take a different direction. The lute was still in use, but uh, um, the, the keyboard became more and more fashionable. So uh, the lute was, uh, as someone said uh, in uh, an author, Detelus said in uh, 1550, that in Paris there was only three elder gentlemen able still to play the lute because nobody was interested anymore. So for nearly 150 to 100 years, the lute became like a dormant until the beginning of the 1900s, when thanks to various, uh, various reasons, uh, people start to discover so-called early music. In this country, we have to say thanks to a French gentleman called Alfred Dolmesch that started to collect what he was left and rebuild in, uh, in his workshop in Azelman a um, lute and other early instruments like, like viola or um, violon and other instruments, sitter and so forth. And thanks to him, the, the resurgence of uh, the, the lute began. In the rest of the Europe, uh, the lute was dis rediscovered, probably more important um, in Germany, in uh, so-called the Van der Vogel, the group of uh, sort of uh, Boy Scouts. They used to gather together and they were trying to uh, recuperate the folk and the ancient music of the Teutonic uh, tradition. Unfortunately, during the war, they got involved in more political, so leave it aside. But at the beginning, the 20s and 30s, there were a group of, uh, uh, of people, they were like uh, boys and girls, they were treated as equal, and they were trying to restore the tradition of their, their country and recuperate all the songs and so forth. But uh, after that, this movement uh, uh, sort of gave the imprint to the what has become uh, in the 60s and 70s the, the hippie movement. They had this lifestyle that uh, uh, wanted to go back to nature and so forth. So, this Van der Vogel, they gave the boost for in the 70s, especially, I repeat, in this country and in, in the States, with the early music, we had a, with the Renaissance band like the amazing Londell and a few others, and uh, the lute, ping, come back again. And uh, in the last 20 years, uh, the lute, thanks to the fabulous work of the Lute Society in the UK, um, they start to, to gather momentum and the study of the lute and the music. And there are around 25,000 pieces of uh, still existing in various uh, sheets and etc. of uh, lute music from the Renaissance and similar for the Baroque you know, uh, period. So there is a quite a wealth of uh, um, pieces you can study, you can work. And uh, I would say that if you're a lutenist, you choose uh, your instrument, because if you like medieval or renaissance, you will never play with a baroque instrument, because you will never be able, because 
the music is written for different uh, uh, string and, and etc. So, but uh, you know that is a personal choice. And uh, the lute, I will say here, start to get more and more popular because in 2013, Jim Jarmusch made this movie that I recommend called Only Lovers Left Alive, where the protagonist. Uh, Tom Edelson plays Adam, the vampire, and he plays this most amazing example of lute. This is actually was made by an, a, a maître luthier, uh, Simon Barber, that passed away a couple of years ago. They used to be based in London. It was made specifically for this one. And uh, people started to get back interested in this because they were, I don't know if they fancy Tom Edelson or, or the vampire story, but yes, that is becoming more and more common thanks to that. Or, in 2006 album, Sting, the rock man, decided that he wanted to do something different and he joined the Lute Society. He purchased a large number of instruments from medieval, renaissance, baroque and theorbo. And he learned, and don't get me wrong, he's a quite good, uh, a quite good player, but please don't make him sing because his voice, it is not a voice for Lute music because it is... Uh, well, matter of taste, but believe me, Barbara heard him and trust me, it's like no match of her. Mm. And uh, anyway, so thanks to him, something, uh, the lute was presenting some sort of uh, event uh, in front of the Queen and so forth, uh, and he started to get him out and about again. As you can see, this Rosone here is a different one. I'm not 100% sure who's the maître luthier of this Teorbo. It is a short neck French style, as you can see. And as you can see, he plays uh, the, the chord, and even if it looks like, uh, you know, this is, a, it looks like a proper chord, but this has been strung as a guitar. It's an aberration. Mm. It never had to be like that. Because, I repeat, a lot of people, they get into the lute these days, they are disgruntled or guitarist, the guitar player, they want to try to do something. And so these kind of uh, things start to appear but uh, they are not the correct one, the correct uh, stringing and so forth. But anyway, everyone likes that, so anyway, you know, you have to try to, you know, to re resurface, uh, like in this case, John Dola, but you know. This is the Edin Karazov, that is an excellent uh, artist uh, on his own accord that he collaborated with Sting, as you can see. This is supposed to be the video only. And this is the picture of Sting with his beloved wife. Uh, and I was like to say, you know, with the Teorbo. I'm not going to say someone chooses this image, but I thought it was very amusing, you know. <laughs> but uh, I stopped there. Quite disturbing, actually. Well. Is that an authentic <laughs> dress for the period? Um, uh, no comment. <laughs> 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 I have to say, you know. She looks a little underdressed, surely, it's a, <laughs> after dinner. It's overdressed for yoga. <laughs> Well, you try to get this very, very medieval type, and again, it's a complete wrong because if you go to medieval, you don't get to do the room in Teorbo with a guitar, you know, stringing and so forth. You know. so they're having fun. Like they sold quite. He sold quite a lot of album, you know. And uh, anyway, this is uh, the the loot in these days, uh, as you can see, with this beautiful, correct Renaissance style, you know. And you can see front and back like a proper model. And uh, as you can see, the fret. Uh, oh, God, I'm knocking down. Here, they fit, uh, fitted. They are not no moving. In the old days, this fret they used to be regulated depending on the sound you want to achieve and etc. But uh, uh, this is a beautiful instrument. I think uh, I can't remember. Do you remember the name? Uh, the old Dimitri Luthier made someone in Cheshire. I think it's the chap that uh, that he died actually. But anyway, this is a what a lute model lute you can have now. Bear in mind that if you want to play lute, you can actually buy kit and make your own one. There are different possibilities, but believe me, it is no easy as it sounds to make the lute. Because personally, as I said, I've been playing lute, I give up violin for because I fell in love with the lute many, many years ago, and for nearly, I would say, a good part of 40 years, I still have an issue streaming because here it's very difficult and complicated. You need to be very patient and so forth. Even just to, restrain, to retune it with the keys, 
You know, when you start to hear tuk tuk. So, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, is the Tiobo later or earlier than the. the the Tiobo, Tiobo. Tiobo, yeah, the Tiobo is a Baroque uh, invention. It was created around the 16th, the 1650, 1670 onwards. Mm -hmm. The Tiobo is is started to be, um, we call it the aberration. Not aberration in the sense, of, uh, but you know, give an idea because it get more and more uh, B chord to give uh, more uh, uh, possibility for male voices, uh, castrato oh. voices. Is it the biggest well. sound? Is it louder? No, no. Oh. No, the Tiobo, all the instruments, because the, you know, when you have the guitar, for example, or the other flat instrument, it, the, the sound reverberates in a different way. When it's round, it goes, the, the vibration goes in the body uh, of the, you know, the back, and it takes a different, I don't know, how can I describe it? I wish I could be, I was able to bring my own one that is not being strung. But it's a totally different sound, and uh, I never play a guitar myself. I don't even know where to start to play guitar because I never touch the damn thing. But with the lute, uh, yeah, it's difficult to say. It's absolutely, I don't know, it, it's like to take it taken back in time. It's engulf you, especially when you have this contact and you play. You know, when you play violin, it's become part of you. You play, the violin is your extension. With the lute, the lute is a similar concept because you become one. It's like a hugging, it's like to hold in a child. And you become a part of the, the instrument becomes part of you. I don't know if it's the same with the guitar, so I don't know really say because I never play. But it's a totally different sound, different, I suppose, feeling, you know? And again, because those kids, they tend to, you can hear when they start to do this sound, like clunk, clunk. And you know, okay, stop and retune it again. Bling, bling, bling. Do it again. And you cannot tune it like the guitar or other instrument, or even the violin. You cannot do this, use the same retuning like a violin or the viola, you know, on this. Is a. Is you there's need, no gearing on the knobs. No, you no. need it to be. Because they must just have invented that. Yeah. Well, they <laughs> change and evolving, as Trevor said, the Teorbo change. The Teorbo give a different, uh, you know, when you have a 9, 10, 12, 4, 13, 14 a chord, you know, change could be the sound and etc. But uh, the keys, uh, the tuning, is a century old mm -hmm. problem, never change. If you go to a new concert, even the most uh, accomplished master, I don't know, Sandra Walter, they used to be the most famous uh, player. Even uh, Julian Bream, that is another guy that I forgot to mention it because after Alfred Dolmesch, Julian Bream, that used to be a guitarist, mm. uh, is the one that they reintroduced the lute in the uh, late 50, early 60. And I had the honor to see him because I was a member of the Lute Society, just he passed away last year, a very ancient man. But my, his play, his sound, what he used to get from, even him had a decision. During performance, you have to stop, <laughs> start doing okay. it again. Okay. And so, if someone like Julian Brim was able to, you know, to get to this, in certain in certain ensemble group like Les Arts Florissant or Le, Le Consort du Roi or other group that they use widely the the Renaissance lute, they tended to get uh, minimized because they had the other instrument, so they tended to hard when this has happened, but it does happen, mm. you know, but uh, it's like a little, and I don't think you want to change it, because it's a part of the fun, to a musician, <laughs> you know, and uh, the, the instrument, mine at the moment, is a sitting wrapped in a blanket, an embroidered Indian blanket that I have, on top of a wardrobe, because it's not been strung, and also need, I have some little cracks, because something I have to say that I forgot to mention, the lute, even if you look big, is extremely light. Mm -hmm. Literally, you can hold the instrument like this. Even with my uh, wrong finger that I don't have any sensation, I can hold uh, the neck and the instrument because mm -hmm. it's so light that it's, it's incredible, like, it's like a feather. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is prone to to damages. And one of the most common problems is, is that the, the back, they start to get undone, so they need to be re restored and re glued together, you know. The neck in itself is strong, but it's this part here that's very delicate. And mine has a couple of cracks. And most important, I need to restrung it because I'm not able to do it. You know, I have the set somewhere in the in the in the house, but you know. And uh, also, as someone say, oh, you got the loot tonight, I said, 
I was thinking today about because uh, my lute is a Renaissance one, so it's pretty large, not more like medieval, and my carry box is a tailor made for this instrument. It looks like a coffin. <laughs> and a few times I had to go to the lute society meeting or gathering that we do now and then, you know, socially, pre COVID. People literally look at me like I'm carrying a coffin with a charge inside. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it's not. I actually go stop and say, What are you doing there? So it's an instrument. It's a coffin! And it's not, but because it's been made specifically in the probably 1960 by some hippie or something, it looks like a coffin. <laughs> when they are going to be like, when I get it strung, because uh, at the moment uh, the, the chap they needed to do the restoration and the strung in the mine is a little bit unreliable. So. And uh, because with my finger I cannot do it, I cannot put the tension and etc. Especially on the on the base here, it's very tricky because you need to go in and fix it with the tiny tiny knots. Because each bit of string, the the bike, they need to be fit in there and tied on the top. The top is not bad with the key, but here, believe me, I don't swear in public about sometimes with these things you do. So anyway, to cut, you know. This is what the, the, the lute would inspire. This is the duet, the classic uh, vanitas uh, from the Flemish uh, uh, area. And uh, a lute is an instrument to give joy. People there are supposed to be happy. And uh, again, it is not really what's happening in life, but to be able to play and etc. should inspire joy and happiness because of the, the sound and so forth. So I wanted to finish you know, with this image of joy and uh, to say, if you don't know the, the instrument, have a look, huh? play lute, please don't check first sting, because it will put you off of that, <laughs> but uh, get all the great master, and, uh, and see, this is the one I wanted to play at the end, this is John Dollar Come Again, one of the most beautiful, both musically and lyrically, so this is John poem, Dolan. John Dolan, Come Again. No, it's lacking, right? No, Lacrime not choose this one because Lacrime, you see, this is another, it's a beautiful piece, but Lacrime is extremely sad because it's a st the story of a torment of unrequited love. This as well is unrequited love, but it's more cheerful, it's, a, it's more open to hope, more open to, as the lyric says, something. You know? The voice is here, it's more powerful than actual instrument. Mm. Yeah, it's too loud, isn't it? Mm. It's like shot. No, it's not the, the monster. This is a chap called. I can't it's a good version. Because also, don't forget. This is an ensemble. But this is as an ensemble, as a viola. Can I show you? The one I was going to use is this. May I? Yes. Request that. Uh, perhaps a couple of uh, the links to your videos. Of like course. Box on the on the, the club. Of course. Okay. Listen to you. Can you hear the loop? It's very softer, as you say. It's got less twangy sound yeah. than the guitar. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Oh, so, so, I mean, I don't say anything about music, but it's a soft the, sound. The lute so has nothing to do with the guitar, and I know a lot of guitar players, they say, oh, the guitar is bad. No, it is not. They are totally different. The sound is totally completely, not only because the difficulty to play, bear in mind that, again, I repeat, at the moment I got longer nail, but literally to play, to also, because of the, the vibration of the string on the fret and on the neck give it a specific sound, is something that uh, literally is... Uh, I remember the first time I studied violin, I was uh, around uh, my eighth year, and uh, someone invited <coughs> me to a concert, and there was this lady sang an aria from uh, the 13th century, so very, <coughs> very sad. And oh my God, the sound of this instrument. Um, I remember, I was like, it was like, fell in love at the first 
first, you know, first uh, two bars, you know. And I become obsessed, and because lute at the time it was not that easy to, to find, and it, you know, I put my parents in really quite a nightmare because I, you know, I wanted the instrument, and obviously because I was, uh, I decided to carry on. I did the nine year, the following year, uh, the conservatoire in violin. But after that, I realized, I said, no, I want to do early music. I want to play lute, and uh, there was incompatibility between the two and the conservatoire in Genoa didn't have the lute, so I had to register it with the, uh, Verona, and I had to give up one, and I gave up, I was at the, at the end of my study, you know, another year, become a qualified violinist, whatever, but the lute, oh my god, it's like, it's a very, as someone described, actually, here, uh, Shakespeare, talking about, he wrote, uh, in a Much Ado About Nothing, I had to read it because I would never remember. Now, divine ire, now is, is his souls ravished. Is it not strange that the sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? Because they literally, it takes you another dimension. And the sound of an ensemble, of the single lute, even without the, the voice, the, the song, just the play, is another, is another dimension. And I warmly recommend, I will send you some link, I'm going to send it to, to Clayton, something with the best choice of the instrument. But, um, you know, it's an instrument that, uh, you know, we're sort of uh, jealous of our, uh, as it used to be in the past centuries, but it's good uh, to share because uh, it's uh, one of the most beautiful ever experienced uh, to to put, to have, uh, to listen to a, uh, you know, the reason why the angels always play lute, you know, because uh, it takes her to different dimension. If you have a man and a, or a young girl playing the lute, it's romantic. If you have an old man playing lute, it's going to be more lascivious and more, you know, not very, very <laughs> considered. <laughs> and there are some... Well, you're saying it's a young man's game. No, no, <laughs> the symbology, you see, the symbology is... Uh, if you have the, like uh, a young man or a young girl represent the purity of love because the sound it takes it to certain certain um, feelings. But there are some critics that say to see all the men, especially like um, in a sort like of. Sting. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Who was playing the other one? Uh, yeah. so please yeah. do. And uh, as I said, I don't know if it takes us to the cherubs uh, or to the or the type uh, of uh, strong female uh, as Artemisia Gentileschi or uh, Franz Hals, but uh, the lute is the most incredible instrument that I warmly recommend to look up, you know, and uh, try to discover a different word. You don't need uh, to dress uh, like medieval gowns, uh, you know, but it will help. Yes. You mentioned about the tablature. And I was most interested, I think, and I could be wrong here, but I seem to recall when I visited Vafel Castle a few years ago, there's a chemist's off to one side, and in the chemist there's a very interesting little side room where they've got a shell hole from the Second World War. And fortunately everything survived. And in there is a manuscript, if I recall, from about the 11th century, which shows uh, original musical tablatura. Um, oh. Now, of course, you mentioned there's the lute tablatura, and there are others. And what I was wondering is, is the lute tablatura different, uh, a different evolution to general music tablatura? And that's why we see the tablatura appearing much later, 400 years later. Well, what's happened is this, you know, because the first of, uh, type of music and etc., they use what they say the chironomic movement, the hands, what they, con they conduct to see now, like in the Gregorian experience, as you mentioned it during the last lecture talk, you know, is representing the up and down of the voice, you know, monodic. If you take the great magister of the school, the, the La Scuola di Notre Dame, the magister. Perotinus, they they be, be written down well after they were composed because for a long, long time, like literature, was oral trans, transmission. 
So what you mentioned to say 11th century tablature, I make my hair lose because the earliest example of notation chironomic or notation such as such with Naomi, the so-called Naomi, that is the first type of notation ever recorded. They, and they are kept in the St. Gallen um, Monastery in Switzerland. They uh, they've been written well, say 100, 150, 200 years after they were actually composed, and they, 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 because we know the certain form of music they've been they exist, they've been composed, and etc. Because of the tradition of the monks, but there was nothing so early. So the reason why you say 11th century, 12th century, I'm like, we there is nothing on the medieval music. Uh, uh, in the parchment or even on the manuscript. Uh, so, you know. so, sorry, Francis, so, if you understand correctly, you're saying it may be an 11th century tune not only that, notated not only, later. Yeah, but not even that, not even that. In the 11th century, I don't think my knowledge, maybe I'm not, uh, you know. Uh, obviously, I must recall. I, I, I will but it would be very interesting. Please, uh, I will attempt to look up the pictures. Do, um, if, Please if, you, do. if you say Clayton, the email of the links, then hopefully that will trigger my memory and I will try and look them up for you because I actually have photographs of the I would be very, very interested because not for myself, but I know really musicologists, uh, even the Duke Society, or my, you know, lots of people they are into, you know, I know that the, there are at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, uh, I've seen some manuscript where there are, but they are much later. They are uh, notation with Naomi uh, but around 1470, 1460. I am no expert in notation. Yeah. Uh, Not either but, line, but, but notation. Yeah. musical stables and so forth, and that's, I saw that, and I asked people, and they said, yes, this is it. And I was. I would be delighted to know. I, was, I, I have to say, I was ecstatic to see that. I am not an expert in this area. Absolutely, I'm a scientist, I'm not, a, uh, not an artist. Uh, but I, and I'm very happy to be corrected. I, 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 I look I'm forward to your, delighted to I learn. I look forward to your correction because no, 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 me, no, me. Because I am, as I said, for the lute and ballet and etc. I, am not an expert, but I can, you know, 40 years old. But, I mean, these, these, but this is very interesting. These were very, they were, they were. They, it, what was interesting is that you could see the parallel lines. There were about five or six, if I recall. I can't remember the picture off the top of my head. I'm sorry. It was a few years ago. And you could quite clearly see staves on there as yeah. well. There was no treble or bass clef, yeah. um, if I recall. Um, and there were no uh, annotations above or below. It was very simple. Because, again, I did a course uh, um, organized by the uh, Salzburg Conservatoire uh, on uh, transla translating uh, medieval notation, neon neonomic. Uh, uh, notation to current uh, um, pentagram and etc. And again, I repeated that I, I remember clearly that the first uh, um, parchment, the first uh, uh, example of a notation, neumatic notation, is kept in St. Gallen and it wow. is around the 13th century. And it is a, a piece of, uh, um, of a, 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 a missa, a mass for, uh, I remember exactly what saying, for one of the festivals of the church. And it is a, a Pass pass over centuries in uh, um, to the mo in the monastery. Now something else that comes to my mind, but this is something I take it with a pinch of salt because something that uh, um, talking about uh, talking about sleeves and parchment, something was found a parchment, but again it was around I think the 15th century inside used to uh, to pad a, a bishop hat <laughs> and. Uh, it is, if I remember reading about it, and it, because uh, it was found in a, in, a, in a collection in Reykjavik or something like that, and it was like a, a song, but a body song, like a tavern song, that it was found in, during the restoration of this, uh, this bishop hat. But I don't, at the moment, my brain is getting really muddled up. I need to look, probably uh, try to find out more. But. Um, the notation, the first, uh, you know, it was like uh, written down books and etc. We don't have like the manual, like we have now. Say, if you want to learn lute, uh, lute the first thing you buy is the uh, Diane Poulton, uh, the lutenist, you know, and that is the basic. 
But in those days, until late, very, very late, there was nothing written. If you think, for example, the, fam the, famous, the famous case of, uh, because the music, it was kept very secret. If you think of the famous uh, Allegro de Miseria, nothing for lute, but it was uh, kept uh, completely secret. Mm -hmm. Only certain people could access, only Mozart was able to, to remember and he wrote it down. It was only, you were only permitted to sing it. Um, At the Sistine Chapel during the mass of the, the break of the light. And it was only uh, when uh, Mozart, that he was attending the, the, this mass, uh, he wrote it down and he started to sound, the, the, the Pope wouldn't believe it because he said, oh, this little boy has done this and that. And nobody would believe it. Only then he started to get uh, written down. Mm -hmm. I think that it was the first example of written music. And this was at the Mozart time. So Mozart was a child. I think it was 12 when it happened. I don't remember the exact age. Magical spell. Music, so. Yeah, he just listened for one, one time, one, only once uh, the, the execution of the music. Yeah. yeah, and he wrote it down. And the Pope was... So the he got, yes. yes. Well, it didn't exist, but you know, give, give it the permission to, to publish uh, the actual uh, composition in uh, perpetuity, you know, in eternum, ad eternum, thanks to him. And that started to get more and more the music. The first great, as I mentioned earlier, the first coded uh, book of uh, music was Francesco da Milano in late uh, uh, 1500 in Venice. That's it, because they were kept secret. You pay a, ma a, ma a teacher, a maestro, yeah. You, you pay for it and he teaches you how to do it, but you play by ear. You can compose so much, but nothing is written. Yeah. Green sleeves, why so famous with the various variations? Because it was past and past and past and etc. So, but uh, yes, there are certain composers now that they do sort of work in modern uh, lute playing, but believe me, it is not. Uh, it's a matter of taste. So personally, I'm very attached to the old school, the old style. Yes. Tap. Does it have anything to do with uh, figured bass? Because I assume it's all about that sort of period, isn't it? Monteverdi, the yes. continuum yes. writing. Presumably, yeah. does it work like that? Or uh, well, do you mention Monteverdi? Monteverdi, uh, from your famous uh, Missa Papa Marcelli, that is the first of what he called the Utero Remito Salsula. It's a start the notation, notation in the more. In UK, you use a letter A, B, C, whatever, but uh, worldwide you have the Utero Remito Sol coming from the Missa Papa Marcelli. It's one of the first examples, but again, it was to be able to uh, to buy a book of music, you could buy a whole instrument. The cost of the actual manuscript or the book, until Gutenberg started to use the press, etc., etc., was exorbitant. Mm. You know, even in monasteries, exactly as I mentioned in St. Gallen, there are certain, but there is no much. The ancient codes, you can have like some codes of middle, but it's more, first of all, most it was ecclesiastical, because the majority of the, the composition that were kept in monasteries where someone could write down, you know, copy, or whatever, but uh, the old church music, you know. In, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Van der Vögel, they were inspired by the Van der Minstrel in the medieval time, where they used to literally go down and perform for, for peanuts, and you know, with and the lute at the time was used with the title, the neck standing, they used to go, you know, and um, the cost of the actual instrument would be less than mm -hmm. the actual manuscript. You know, books were very, very expensive. So even until probably the 17th century, I think. <coughs> but to line the lute with pages from the Gutenberg Bible yeah, the is Tiefenbrück. unbelievable. Yeah. Because that would have been uh, fabulously expensive, each yeah. copy of the Gutenberg Well, no, what's happened, uh, probably, what's happened probably is this, like uh, the reuse of the manuscript uh, or the, uh, in the hat. Well, in the hat, uh, someone said, uh, remember this detail, there was like some sort of a joke uh, that someone put in, you know, Lining a bishop hat with a bow, the vulgar, you know, canon um, song. Because um, also it's in Old Norse, uh, Gamble Norse is also very, the reason why I remember this, uh, this thing. Um, I go, Gamble Norse is probably the early form, uh, well, it is a reform of Icelandic, the reason why it's still uh, in existence in the hat. But the, um, the Gutenberg probably was like, you know, maybe. At the time when the Bible became, uh, you know, don't forget that there was a time when uh, the Bible has to be written in a certain way because otherwise it would be considered um, heretic, 
you understand it was like how many books have been destroyed at the time of the dissolution they were, they were considered you know Catholic popes and etc so a wealth of knowledge of books that they've been you know in this case maybe maybe I don't know maybe it was a Lutheran follower that he considered the Gutenberg Bible too close to Rome to to no worth it and they will use it for some sort of a you know like a or maybe or maybe they lined it with the the basic Gutenberg Bible because it is heavenly music. Um, this it could be because of Gutenberg. Um, sorry, uh, Martin Luther, for example, was an excellent Lutheranist. He always uh, said that the music uh, opens to the mind to God, and only in his family and his wife Catherine and the children they were absolutely we know um, because you know reports and etc. Uh, expert uh, Lutenist could well be, but uh, we don't know. This is kept in Florence, and uh, when I was doing my course, uh, I helped the restore. I couldn't play because uh, you're not allowed, uh, even if I try to. Uh, I just, you know, I just held it. It's like, uh, to, yeah, you know, it's one of the instruments that as a, It's like a two uh, Genoa. In Genoa, you have the we have the they have. Sorry, I'm crazy. They have. The canone, the Gabriele del Gesù, owned by uh, Niccolò Paganini, that as a violinist is the, the Holy Grail. The Messiah that is uh, uh, in uh, Oxford uh, is sad because uh, it's a beautiful instrument, but clearly now we will not play it properly. But the, you know, because the, the, nobody can touch it, it's been uh, one of the reasons why it's been left in, in eternum uh, at the museum with a proviso that it will never be played. So this instrument is dead, like the the, the lute that they have in that. But in um, for a musician in Genoa, the canone, the owned by Niccolò Paganini, especially for a violinist, to be able to hold it is like you know you cannot play because only the winner of the Paganini Prize every year is allowed to play. Maxim Wenger of uh, is one of the one that's allowed to be, it's been allowed to but use But I know it. that just because what you say, to keep it alive, they yeah. used to sometimes... No, in general, no, I tell you, in general the, the, because it is well known that every instrument needed to be played, otherwise it tends to decay, because it needs the, the temp body temperature, don't ask me why, the wood contracts or whatever, I'm not a, a, an expert on this, but they need. In general they have a, a specialist, uh, people, there is a they, they do that, uh, yeah, uh, regularly, the they are strong and they play, yeah. but the only person that is officially allowed to play the canone is in concert after the winner of the Paganini Prize. Yeah, uh, I knew that, I knew year. that. Yeah. Yeah. my family will all violinists. So. Yeah, and uh, I hold it in my hand because I am like the kind of person that, like, you know, but I couldn't <laughs> play, I didn't have the ball. No, no, no. <laughs> but yes, and the Tiff and Brucker to held the different Brucker for me is the the holy grail of the roots because it is perfection. It is a typical Renaissance lute, beautiful shape, pear shape, beautiful rounded, and is oh you know it's the magic. When you mention to a lutenist Tiffen Brucker, yes you can say Simon Barber, you can say this, you can say that. Mine is a, probably I don't know, and I can't remember the name because it's probably minor, but uh, that instrument. Uh, to be able, I was tempted, but they would like, you won't touch it, you can't touch it. <laughs> and it's actually strung with the cartoon. So there is also to be very careful because if it's a cartoon that is decayed, it probably snap and then you will be in trouble. Mm. There is a collection in uh, South London, in uh, what is called the, the museum, not far from where um, the chapel lives. Remember that we went and we saw the museum? Oh, about, uh, that one. Yeah. They have a beautiful instrument. I don't know if they play or not. I uh, discovered this when I was talking to to Chris Goodwin, that is the secretary of the Luke Society, and uh, he told me that uh, they have a beautiful series of instruments, <coughs> but uh, they are not uh, open to the public for playing. Mm -hmm. You know. On the subject of instruments, boring etymological question: mm -hmm. um, the Kitarola Romano. Yeah. Are all lutes uh, chitaroni? They're called chitaroni romani or theorbos, the actual correct name. Mm. They are arch lute. Yes, I was wondering about that. Arch, exactly, mm. Mm. inflate, arch, bigger. But are, are all lutes chitaroni? Yes, they are considered part of the family of the lute. Mm. Everything, um, the family of the lute is uh, basically goes from the Al Amir Alud, 
the Arabic. Bear in mind that a mirror wood has a smaller neck. Uh, you know, this, the wood has a completely different neck. You see here, the lute has a very long uh, part of the neck where you have the keys. The wood is a, it's a straighter and is more round. It is more like a mandolin. Mm. You know, but they're all the same family, the mandolin. Uh, the, the, thing, family. the thing that interests me is that um, the keeper, of course, is, an yeah. ancient, is the ancient Greek lawyer. Yeah, correct. But these things look nothing like a keeper. They're, they they're, look like a chlamys, if anything, which is another sort with a tortoise shell at the bottom. Correct. So I wonder, is this was this terminology arrived at in the Renaissance when they well, were digging up all of this old music? Like, you in touch in Genzo, a in good that. point that, that um, I haven't mentioned. The reason why the lute uh, it become like a so popular in the Renaissance is because the Renaissance the lute was considered direct descendant from the chitara mm. and the lyre that is not, not at all because the, the classics were considered the epitome of uh, knowledge and blah 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 but uh, there is no no connection whatsoever the old is the direct closest uh, closest uh, relative of the lute the sitar is considered belonging to the lute family as an archi lute because he has a, the string with a lot of chords and etc. Even if they are single strings, uh, no chord. But uh, as I mentioned, we have this, the archi lute or chitarrone originally had a B chord, but there are some experiences like later, like the one the string, string plays, they have like a uh, guitar string. Mm -hmm. But I still consider a lute, archi lute. Mm -hmm. But I repeat, for the purist, there is a medieval lute and a renaissance lute. After the baroque lute, you know, John Dollar, etc., they start to get all these various things and etc. But uh, no. You know, I just wonder if that's if the shape of it uh, could perhaps be related to the old uh, chlamys with the with the tortoise shell, because of course there are plenty of links, musical links, are between India and the East and yeah. ancient Greece. I wonder if that was an attempt to replicate it, or perhaps there was just parallel evolution. They came to that shape because it made the sound they wanted to. Well, that's it's the same reason they used the tortoise shell. Mention it this: uh, they are representation of virgin uh, followers of the Ishtar cult mm -hmm. in the Mesopotamia. And they play instrument. They are very similar to the archute. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they are from because only there are some sort of uh, uh, depiction. But uh, yeah, this look like archutes. And they are the, the, the servant, uh, the, what I call the, of the Ishta. But we don't know much about it. Ishta exist. was the goddess of love, and they had sacred uh, um, worshippers. Um, I mean, the priest. They, they, they the ancient priest. Mesopotamia. Yeah, yeah, the priest. Yeah. Uh, when they were female, they used to have the um, so prostitution, have uh, sacred prostitution, mm -hmm. because uh, it was supposed to. Let me see if I go to find the, the goddess will by doing this. Mm. Kind of Similar thing in Carthage, wasn't it? Previous there, I can't remember. Yeah, but well, there are definitely because don't forget that Carthage is North Africa where they were. Yeah, they are coming from, uh, from the Phoenician. I don't know they were. I think it sounds very different. There's a history of sacred prostitution that goes back many thousands of years. Sounds very different. The Easter was a Mesopotamia was a Mesopotamia before. No, 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 but just the sound. They kept on doing that, even the Phoenician. Mm. With the Phoenicians. Yeah. So, well, the twang, I believe. The the the, I think yeah, they, they kept on doing that. It doesn't have any of the sweetness of Christianity. Well, the oh, the wood is like, sounds like. But the wood is still very, you know, still very used now. I don't yeah, know. yeah, I think I've heard I think it. It's next, it uh, next doesn't sound very much like that. Like Next week, I think, Luca, there is a gig of this Syrian artist uh, playing uh, old okay. in London. You know, and uh, I know that we had at the meeting, because we meet as a Luther Society um, well, at least twice a year. Well, now it's been very, uh, very random. But we had uh, a player, I, was, I didn't attend that event because I was late, and I missed his performance. But uh, this, uh, this chap from uh, North Africa, I think it was uh, Algerian, playing the lute, and everybody heard their comments. They say it sounds like, uh, you know, a medieval lute. You know, also because, again, I repeat, the medieval lute, the, unfortunately, Pepe Frana, the one I was going to play, the piece is very, um, 
very Arab, Arabic type, very, very cheerful. Imagine they, they give you the idea to be in, uh, in some sort of environment the, 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 of the Alhambra in Spain, the Moorish uh, area, in the sound, because that, but again, he's like uh, someone we were talking about, uh, the, the Sumerian, uh, is exactly the same. For a specific time, uh, period of time, we can only suppose what the music used to be like. We know what the Moors, because we have still now a certain tradition, but the medieval music, we know that Enzo, uh, Manfred, sorry, von Stauffen used to play, but what used to play, we don't know, you know? We know the instrument could be like that, but again, it's very arbitrary in a way to depict uh, uh, the instrument as the modern lutenists do. We know they play with a quill because they are painting and so forth, and the writing mentioning certain things, certain practice. But they don't tell you uh, how to play with the finger because a different school. Because I, I used to play with this my small finger and play and use the you know the the middle finger most than everything else. But if you play the quill, you don't use the middle finger. You use just the play. You know that is what they used to be in medieval Renaissance. Change it, the pluck and use the you know. So it's very, very arbitrary in a way, it's until the late 1500s, when the first Capriola, you know, just gonna be out of you know, and uh, so forth. My shirt gets a bit, so we've got some key. Ah! Oh, fantastic. This is the medieval one that was said. This is the Maitrude Gazelle, that is basically the, the one that we're supposed to play. Thanks, Barbara. She's a, she's, I, have to say, I have to say thanks to Barbara because she created this uh, presentation. She did everything. She put it all together because I am a dinosaur. As you can see, I can't even use this. But she's done. And thanks to her, this is exactly. I think she deserves you know, more than me on this. You know, my, um, and you find this. Hold on. Let me. This is hold on. Please. Very fast. There is no bass here. There's only the six B chord. Medieval. And he's playing the queen. Medieval. Mm. Hold on. Some million miles from keyboard music is it virgin music for virgins. Mm -hmm. But you see, the, 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 even the instrument, it. as I say, is very more Moorish, except for the neck, that is lute, it could be a lute, uh, it could be an old. Thank you. But the sound is very different, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. An old has a completely different sound. Mm -hmm. Well, the Moorish music yeah. has such a different sound from... I, and I know I, I know basically nothing about the history of music, unlike you, yourselves. But I always wondered why Middle Eastern, North African music sounds so different right. from our music. It's, because you think that's kind of a universal thing, but it's I mean, but it's know. also cultural. I think, that, for example, uh, the great mag magisters of uh, lute music they reflect. Uh, for example, the Renaissance, the uh, Italian Renaissance in Florence, in Venice, mm. they have a specific thing. As I mentioned, John Dola is much later, but mm. it's a very um, different sound. If you take a Spanish music, like the one I was going to play with Ensemble, it's very Spanish. You can feel it. If you take Milan, that is the most famous Lutenist composer in the, that we know, is uh, you can recognize. It's like there is something, you know, that is Spanish. This is really no, sure. it's very but, but it's just like the notes sound different. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's radically different. Yeah. So, you know, Italian classical music of the 1600s is slightly different from German classical music mm. of the 1600s. But they're using similar instruments, and the notes to an ignorant ear as mm. mine sound like they're in the same family. Whereas <coughs> Indian. Yeah, but the seat are totally different. Or yeah. It's just like they're almost like different notes, and it's, it's fascinating to me that. They are like tuning systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really different. Yeah. Well, you're talking about yeah. tuning. That's yeah. quite Indian. Uh, yeah. Tuning the lute, uh, you know, the tuning of the lute, the Renaissance lute uh, and the uh, Baroque, totally different. Because they're different, different instruments. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to uh, want to learn a medieval lute or a Renaissance or a Baroque, you can't play the composer from the 15th century on the Baroque. No, 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 like no. Because, you know, yeah. Yeah, because there is a, the adding uh, of the of the chord, the strings, uh, the grows. As I said, the medieval had the six. Actually, there's some some of them using a lute, a medieval lute with the five, you know, chords. Uh, 
strings, sorry, set of strings, I call it B chords because they are two chords next to each other. And after become <coughs> six, so that is most common medieval, Renaissance six plus two, the two basses, because they were more accompanying the male voice, very bass, bass watch, and, uh, and so forth. You know, mm. but it's an instrument that uh, there are some modern composers, they compose for medieval, uh, sorry, for Renaissance lute, they you think, why? You should be shot, but again, <laughs> no, seriously, it's like, you know, there is this Norwegian composer that he has, he, he has a lute, Renaissance lute and viola. And you think, why? And it's basically, honestly, mm. you, you don't want to get in there because, again, matter of time. Viola is in the modern one? Yeah. No, no, the modern one, because oh, I'm not talking about the, oh, the viola. Yeah. 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 Right. Because uh, you're talking about the viola, like uh, the Marie Maren Mar type, of your, exactly. Mm. Uh, Marie Maren, uh, or the composer, or what's his name, or the other one, Signor de Mons, the Monsieur de. Vincenzo Galilei. Vincenzo Galilei? Oh, honestly, I should. This is the father of the great man. This is the one that created. This was, a, um, even if it was from Pisa, we worked this in, uh, in, uh, in Venice. Hold on. Okay. This is an ensemble, there are two roots. This is the classic Renaissance, Italian Renaissance looking music. Did you hear when it, they went uh, it come off tune? Just like. Just like huh? Counterpoint, it's nothing like the weird and wonderful stuff you got in England. You mentioned about the English, you mentioned about the English, but as I'm sure you're well aware, there's there's various styles of North African music. No, I'm not, I don't talk about because I've never used it, I don't even touch one. There is, uh, there's the, there's, there's Gunal and Berber, and Berber is more uh, it's African, Gunal is more Arabic in the use of the and Yes, you sorry. can tell the difference, it's quite easy. The babel is very much repetitive, the rhythmic, hypnotic beat. The babel is because the very people are playing there. Yeah, yeah the babel. Oh from the Berbers, yeah, yeah, from yeah, yeah. Uh, Southern Africa, from basically in ancient times, of course, so the, the, the uh, Sahara was a total separator. So you have the African Gunal, and you have the Southern shall we say, African, as in sounds of the, uh, uh, the yeah, Sahara, the, kind of by, the Babel, by, by, yeah. and the Ganao is a much more delicate, sophisticated music. Uh, I mean, I, I strongly urge going to Morocco, um, and there's an excellent restaurant there, if only I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, in those days, it would be interesting. It. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not expensive, but it's absolutely beautiful. By the way, you get excellent cocktails there as well. And they have <laughs> so excellent the 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 Thank you. I have to check it because I must admit I never they got into the I know the order but then I've been a little bit because my love is for the lute is my unrequited love you know because believe me once you get in your blood early music is like uh, in every form and everything is like uh, you know you can't get stopped but uh, anyway sorry a kind this of is this is a Spanish lute playing that's very very Spanish. I know this is one piece, but they all have this kind of a trace all along. Is that a similar period? Well, I mean, if I get like uh, the different school. Pretty harmonic now, I'm surprised by that. It's very sort of top down, it's very vertical. 
There is a system of um, a set of music called Passa. No, not Passa Calia. Sorry. But basically, it's like the folia. The folia? No, no. This sounds more like North African to me. Well, Spanish, because yeah. it's war. But it's you the know, time of. I have a CD in Italy. Uh, it is um, a, a Spanish medieval music that is actually more more yeah, yeah, yeah. that is because they had this kind of a time where they were bought, you know, and, 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 and they were, I mean, they kind of clean after the Reconquista, but yeah. they, they, the culture was so deep inside for so many centuries. That they couldn't get rid of that. So it's, sure. they kept on having this music that was a mix of Arabic and European something, I don't know. It's very special, one of a kind cultures that was in Spain because of the Moorish. Uh, yeah. uh, ah, Moorish uh, influence. Yeah, it's a form of typical passamate. Oh, wow, he's gone there, hasn't he? Anyway, yeah, you'll have my friends. I presume we've all heard of the Tickle Fiddle. There, there was a, the, um, the, the, uh, sorry? The Tickle Fiddle Gentleman's Club. I forget the name. Thank you very much. Let's call it a day. Yeah, thank you. I have no idea if the stream worked, but I assume you did. Have you enjoyed it? Um, see you next month. Thank you very much. Oh, the battery lasts. Amazing, isn't it? Thank you.